All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Dan Laskar. Uh, I'm a postdoc here. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, we're going to start a, uh, a six lecture series on uh, detector physics. And um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me uh, along the way. Uh, we're basically going to be uh, meeting every week at this time. There are a couple of exceptions. Uh, the last class uh, is actually going to be moved, but we'll go over that later uh, in the course. Uh, and then there's another class that's moved, but it's in the syllabus. Who here has downloaded the syllabus? Good. I highly recommend that you do so. Uh, I'll post the, uh, the website and I'll send it out again uh, afterwards. Uh, but this, the, uh, the website's a good place to find the syllabus. It's a good place to find the old lectures. It's also a good place to find homework answers. Uh, so there are going to be one or two homework problems. Nothing onerous, just some, uh, some basic problems that uh, you can do on your own and uh, they're not gonna be graded simply for your own enrichment, just like the rest of this class. So as we go through, uh, I'll post homework assignments. I'll give them on the Monday and I will post them uh, probably Wednesday night. So you have some time to work on it, but nothing that's hanging over your head for too long. So uh, let's start with uh, some basics of uh, detector physics, in particular, uh, how radiation interacts with matter. That's, that's the starting point for basically everything that we're going to be doing. Uh, and so in this, uh, in this lecture, we're going to go through uh, an introduction of the cross-section. We're going to introduce uh, the mean free path uh, as it relates to the cross-section. We're going to build that up from just basic probability of, uh, of interaction. Uh, then we're going to go over uh, some of the methods of energy loss that radiation experiences as it interacts with matter. Um, and we'll go through different types of radiation, different types of, uh, of interactions. So to start with, a, uh, a charged particle uh, going through matter, you're basically going to deal with, for the most part, two types of interactions most of the time. All right, this is done. Anyway. Two types of uh, interaction most of the time. The biggest one and most likely one and the one that you're basically going to be dealing with in this class just about all the time is inelastic collision with the target's electrons. That's going to be um, most of the interaction that, that you care about. Uh, so um, let's see. After that you've got elastic scattering uh, within the target's nuclei and that's the largest fraction of interaction that uh, that you will see. However, what we care about in general tends to be these things at the bottom, Cherenkov radiation, nuclear reactions, which uh, is kind of why we're uh, in business to begin with, uh, measuring nuclear reactions, measuring the result of nuclear reactions. What we tend to measure with detectors tend to be the results of nuclear reaction and how inelastic collisions happen inside a detector and measuring the energy uh, inside there. In terms of, uh, of small cross sections, um, gamma induced beta decay has something on the order of like 10 to the minus three barns, and the barn is again uh, 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. We're gonna discuss the entire concept of the unit of barns in the next slide. Um, when I say that inelastic collisions are, are the most likely, uh, you're basically dealing with a cross-section that's between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 barns. Uh, so inelastic collisions with atomic electrons, any charged particle going through is going to have a uh, collision somewhere between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 barns, which is really quite large. Um, so to begin with the introduction of, uh, of cross-section, we kind of start with a situation where you have a beam of particles on a single scatterer, one target particle. Uh, and from there, we build up to, to larger materials. And so the cross-section is, in, in very basic terms, the probability per unit solid ankle that a beam will scatter. All right? And that's the, uh, that's the fraction, that's what's known as the fractional cross-section, d sigma over d omega. All right? Now, Unit analysis is going to force cross-section to be in units of area, but it is, uh, some of, most of you have seen this before, but those of you that haven't should know, it's not really an area. It's a probability, all right? It's just, we need to put it in these units to make it work out. Um, so you have a beam, 
You have a beam incident on a target with a target flux F. And let's see if this works. Sure. With a flux F. And N sub S is the, uh, the, the average number of scattered particles per unit time. This is scattered <laughs> particles going through a solid angle D omega. Now, if you want to talk about the, uh, the cross section over all solid angles, you simply integrate. Uh, over all solid angles, and that gives you the, uh, the total cross section. All right, whereas previously we had the cross section split out uh, per unit solid angle. Here is the full cross section with the full integration over all, uh, over all solid angles. And then that again is for one scatterer, one single atom. Now, real life doesn't let you use one atom as a target. You, you need a target material. Uh, that you can put into space, that you can manipulate very easily. And so we, we tend to, to think of targets in real life as either thin targets or very thick targets, but just some amount of material. And so in this case, we, uh, we talk about uh, a thin uh, sheet of material, um, one whose area is considerably larger than the beam area. So that in that case, you get to make the approximation or make use of the fact that the beam is really the only area you care about. The target is as large as the beam, because if the target is much larger than the beam, it doesn't really matter. The only interaction you're going to have is within the area of the beam. So you've got a thin target. It's got a small thickness delta x. You've got some density of scatterers. It's just the atomic density of whatever you have inside there, um, multiplied by the number of electrons in the lattice, because in this case, again, most of what you're dealing with is really the interaction within the bound uh, electrons in the uh, in the lattice. So, and then you've got what you want to end up doing is given this cross section, you want to create a probability of having interacted within after traveling x distance within a material. So, if you've got a very thick material at x equals zero, where you are just getting to the surface of material, the probability of interaction is zero. You haven't done anything. You haven't gotten into the material. But if it's infinitely long, it will eventually be one. If it is infinitely long, there is a 100% probability that whatever it is that you're passing through this target will have interacted. What that interaction is remains to be seen, and that needs to be separated out for different interactions so, uh, depending on what it is you're studying. But the basic idea here is you're talking about some unknown interaction that you are defining as sort of a, a thought experiment. Some interaction happens uh, as a probability function of x. And so you start with uh, the flux times the area times the density of scatterers times the distance times the, uh, the, the, uh, the cross-sectional area. Um, and that gives you the, uh, let's see, the average number of scattered particles per solid angle. Again, this is not for one scatterer. Now this is for many scatterers within uh, the thin sheet. And so to integrate, when, when you integrate all of that, you get the total number of scatterers. Uh, sorry, the total number of scattered particles over all space, uh, over all solid angles. And then if we divide by the, the, the flux and the area, uh, we get the probability. Uh, and again, that is the probability for scattering of a single particle within a thickness delta x. This gets more interesting as you have not an infinitesimally small sheet of particles, but a larger sheet with some finite thickness that you can calculate. And in order to do that, you need to go over a couple uh, probability arguments. So we start out with the top, the same equation that we finished with. It's probability function that within some thickness, uh, the probability of having, uh, having passed through a material of thickness delta x, we have a probability of, we have a probability of interaction um, of n sigma times delta x. We start out with that on top. And what we have now is trying to find what is the probability of the particle having interacted after some distance x within the target. Now, you don't really have an infinitesimally thin target anymore. Now you've got a real live target that's three, that has three dimensions that you care about. There's, a, there's material passing through it. It's got a finite thickness. What is the probability of interaction once you get some distance x inside the target? And you set that up by starting with, uh, with this relation. Uh, so x plus delta x, which means it's interacting at that distance delta x. 
So it's the probability that it has already interacted uh, by that point plus the probability that it has not interacted by that point times that delta x interval. All right? Then you do a little bit of algebra and you get this relation. Anyone recognize what the uh, left hand side of the equation is? Derivative. Exactly, it's a derivative. That's all we're dealing with here. So we, simpl so we simplify that just a bit more, uh, clean up some of the, the functions of x, but we remember that p is a probability function of x, but uh, we make it just a little bit cleaner to write. So dp dx is equal to one minus p times n sigma, right? The probability of not interacting times the, uh, the density of scatterers times the cross section, all right? And now you make use of a nice little relation here. This is a, a bit of an odd, uh, uh, an odd relation, so you should probably spend a little, uh, a second or two thinking about this, but you take advantage of the fact that, I'm quoting this directly, the change in the probability of non-interaction is necessarily the negative of the change in the probability of interaction. Right? The probability, the change in the probability that something will have interacted by that distance x is simply in the, the negative of the probability that it didn't interact. So now, instead of taking the derivative of the probability function, you're taking the derivative of the non-interacting probability function. And so now you've got a differential equation of x on both sides. Okay? Simple enough. You solve this equation. You've got some constant times the, expo uh, times the exponential that you see. What is the constant? Well, we take uh, advantage of some initial conditions. We know the probability at zero, interact, uh, at zero distance is zero. There's no chance for it to interact with something that isn't there. So C naught is one. Fine, that makes life easy. We don't even have to carry it anymore. Good, so now you have your solution for, the, uh, for your interaction probability. And they're listed here. One, the probability of an interaction between zero and x. Two, the probability of not interacting between zero and x. And it's all just one, mi one minus the probability of the other. From there, we need to start talking about real measures. And from there, now that we, we've dealt with the cross section, we've, changed, we, we've dealt with the probabilities that are generated by the cross section, okay, fine. <coughs> It's nice to, to, to talk about you know, different percentages throughout, but what does this mean in real life? And for that, we get with the concept of, uh, we get the concept of, of mean free path. Uh, for that, you have a probability function, which we know we've already calculated, and from there, we go to what's known as the probability density function. You may have seen this from, uh, in quantum mechanics in different forms, uh, but the basic idea is simply the, uh, the derivative of the probability function. It's given here. All right, and so the caveat is, is that this holds for as long as the probability function is continuous. If you are going through different materials and you have a discrete, or sorry, a discontinuity in your probability function as you uh, split materials, you have to solve this uh, for each continuous segment. You have to solve the equation separately for each continuous segment. Not particularly difficult, but it's something that you always have to keep track of. So from there, the mean free path, the average distance that some particle will travel before an interaction, that's all it is, is simply the expectation value of x given this probability density function. All right, and it's, uh, in this case, I have an, uh, in this example, I have an infinitely long target. If you were to have a finite target, you would just replace the infinity with, uh, with an L, all right, for the length of the target. Oops, and the result of this, uh, assuming an infinitely long target, the result of this calculation is simply it's one over the density times, uh, the density of scatterers times the cross section uh, of each scatterer, which makes some amount of sense. And if you do the, uh, the unit analysis, you will get uh, a unit of length because this is, per centimeter cube, and this is times centimeter squared, you get, uh, you get a length in the, uh, in the result. So that makes life easy. Now, you've got an interaction probability, you've got a mean free path, you're able to be conversant 
in how particles move through and you start dealing with uh, and, and lengths that they will go through and you start to think about what will actually happen during this passage. And so you begin to realize that there are really two kinds of regimes uh, that, that you're dealing with when a charged particle is moving through matter. One is uh, when electrons or positrons move through matter. And the second regime is when everything else moves through matter, right? Electrons and positrons are sort of a special case. And um, he's just standing outside looking. Um, anyway, uh, electrons and posit positrons are a special case because they are so light. Everything else, whether it's muons, kaons, protons, neutrons, uh, alphas, heavy elements, they all will interact in very, very similar ways simply because they are so much more massive. It's the lightness of the particle that makes, uh, which makes them sort of interesting and, and separate from, uh, from other heavier particles. Neutrinos are also special in this respect, but much, much, uh, much, much lower, uh, not quality, lower probability interaction. So we're not going to deal with them right now. It makes life much more difficult uh, to deal with them, and that's sort of a special topic that if there's really an interest, we can go through uh, at the end of the course. Um, so we've got these, uh, these two regimes. Uh, and so before proceeding, we sort of want to look at, at the classical picture. Uh, before we introduce any major relativistic or quantum mechanical issues, uh, associated with moving through uh, basically a lattice of electrons. All right. Uh, what we have is a heavy particle passing through material. The particle is going to have mass m. And again, this is really only the interaction of the heavy particle with the electrons in whatever target material we're in. So we've got a heavy particle of mass m much greater than the mass of the electron. It's got a charge z on it. It's got a velocity v or beta, which is a fraction of c. And it's basically going to travel in a straight line. This is an OK assumption for now. Later, we're going to find where this doesn't hold. Now, some pieces about the electron in the lattice that this is interacting with. It's essentially free. It's a re it is essentially at rest to start with. And there is negligible movement due to interaction with other electrons. All right? Whatever deviation happens, happens after the fact, after the, uh, the collision. In, in the center, the black spot moving with a velocity v, mass m, and charge z is your beam particle. <laughs> and up in blue is the electron. All right? The b, the distance of b is the radius of this cylinder that, that we're in. It's the distance of closest approach. That's a variable that we're going to need uh, to be solving for, and it's moving along the x direction. All right? So we start with uh, the momentum imparted to the electron by some heavy particle, OK? That's simply just the impulse. You integrate the force over time, which is really the charge of the, uh, the electron times the elect multiplied by the electric field, uh, sorry, the perpendicular component of the electric field of the, uh, of the massive charged particle. All right, now you move some terms around. Um, it's easier in this case to integrate over uh, over space rather than over uh, over time. So we make use of the fact that uh, the particle is coming in uh, with a mass much greater. It's not going to change velocity. Basically, it's not going to change velocity. So you can make this approximation, bring v out of the, uh, the integral. Now you just have the, uh, the perpendicular component, all right? Because all other components of the electric field will cancel. And what remains the, the um, what remains is the, uh, the perpendicular component, and it's the component that is perpendicular to the particle's trajectory. OK, fine. This comes out. Doo -doo -doo. V is not a function of x, because v is constant. That's nice. Now, we want to solve this, uh, this integral, uh, e perpendicular dx. We make use of, uh, of this relation, which is over uh, over the core, it's uh, basically Gauss's law. So we uh, we calculate the integral uh, to use Gauss's law over basically an infinitely long cylinder of radius b. B is again the uh, the the distance of closest approach. All right, and this is uh, this is the end result. So you plug in this result into the integral, 
and you have the uh, the answer for uh, for the impulse that you're giving to uh, to the electron. Okay, the energy gained by the electron is essentially this: it's the impulse squared, so p squared over two m. The impulse and momentum have essentially the same units because they're basically the same thing uh, within this context. All right. Impulse squared over twice the mass of the electron gives you the change in energy as a result of this uh, of this interaction. All right, that change needs to be integrated over uh, over the, uh, the the space of possible interactions. So as b changes, remember b is is a variable. You could be you know you could be close, you could be far. Uh, the electron could be close or far from the uh, the incoming target particle. And so you integrate over the, uh, the volume of a cylinder of radius b uh, and uh, thickness db. Uh, and so you can then change the volume, uh, the volume component that you're integrating over to uh, a spatial component. Continue with the integration, do some algebra. You get this result where you're basically integrating 1 over b. Uh, well, yeah, we're integrating 1 over b. This integral is a problem because you cannot integrate over zero when you do this. So you're basically integrating from a minimum uh, approach distance to a maximum approach distance. So now you need some more arguments to figure out what the minimum and the maximum are. Okay? For minimum and maximum, uh, minimum is essentially a head-on collision. It's effectively zero, but you, you, you need to figure out what that is. But in a head-on collision, the particle is going to get a maximum energy. So you use the relativistic energy that, that it would be given, which is 2 times gamma squared times the mass times the velocity squared. All right. In the classical picture, it would just be 1 half mv squared. But with relativity, because you're adding that, that uh, 2 v gamma function, uh, it's a 2 v gamma term rather than v, uh, you are, uh, you're, you're, you're going to get um, a 2 rather than the 1 half uh, as a result because it becomes 2, two squared times 1 half. Um, and once you do that, just some algebra gives you uh, an expression for uh, the minimum distance. The maximum distance basically uh, assumes a bound orbiting electron. That's basically how far you can be uh, and still hit an electron because the electron is always going to be bound in this uh, in this situation. <clears throat> the initial approximation when we said the electron is free is really only true in the small space of interaction. The larger space that it's operating in is the is the electron's orbit. So in this case, we can say that it is uh, that it is bound. It's just bound in a much larger space. Um, so t int is simply the uh, the interaction. Um, yeah, the interaction time, and that interaction time has to be less than the uh, the orbit is the uh, the orbital frequency of the electron. All right. Otherwise, if it weren't the case, otherwise the perturbation is essentially adiabatic, and um, and there's no energy transfer. All right. This is what's known as um, this this approximation is what's known as adiabatic invariance. All right. So we come in, the time is essentially given by this. You, uh, you convert, and please keep in mind the difference between the new and the V for velocity. We're in V for velocity over here too. And uh, you get the, uh, the time, the characteristic time is equal to one over the, character, the average, characteristic frequent, uh, average characteristic orbital frequency. Uh, for a bound electron, and that's how you get B max. All right, simply a rearrangement of terms at that point. All right, you plug in those two values into our equation that we had before, and you get an expression for the change in energy uh, as a function of distance. And it's all based on, you know, initial charge, mass, these aren't changing. The initial velocity, that is definitely something you control. And the orbital frequency, that's basically going to depend on what your, uh, on what your, what material your target is. All right. This classical, uh, this classical calculation uh, was first shown by, uh, by Niels Bohr. It's perfectly fine for alphas or anything heavier. 
However, for lighter beams, you need to deal with quantum mechanics. If you're dealing with heavy particles, if you're dealing with a heavy ion accelerator uh, into a heavy ion target, this is perfectly fine. If, however, you're dealing with electrons, you need to deal with various couplings. And uh, for that, we have something much more complicated. It's what's known as the beta block uh, energy loss, uh, sorry, the beta block equation. Uh, it's for linear energy transfer, all right? I'm not gonna go over the derivation of this because it would be way too long. It would be a, a lecture in and of itself. Um, I will say that uh, section 2.2 in, uh, in Leo's book deals with this particularly well. Uh, so I would um, tell you to, to investigate this at either your peril or your leisure, uh, possibly both. But um, just going over some of these terms to, uh, to make sure we're all on the same page, the energy loss per unit length, just like before. Uh, the Z over A ratio is, uh, is your target. So the charge of, the, uh, the, pro the charge of your target over the, uh, the mass. Um, that Z, the small Z is the, uh, the charge of your beam. I is the mean excitation energy of your, uh, of your target. Um, w max is uh, the work function. It's essentially the maximum energy transfer uh, possible to the electron. Uh, we'll go over that in just a moment. Um, and then you've got these other correction terms, one for the density of the material uh, and two for any corrections that are associated with the shell, the shell structure of, uh, of the electron lattice. All right, that W max, that max energy transfer to, uh, to the electrons is given by, uh, by this equation. Um, Again, this is not really for, for discussion, it's more for your own edification. If it's the sort of thing that, that this is a good spot to, uh, to go to if you're, uh, if you're really starting to look for, uh, if you're really starting to deal with an electron beam in material and you wanna start, uh, start going over uh, some of these equations in these terms. I just wanna make sure that you all have it, mostly for the sake of completeness. All right, this, uh, this function, if the mass of your target is larger than the mass of the electron, this uh, work function basically goes down to something that we've already calculated. All right, two times the mass of the electron times the velocity squared times gamma squared. That is, we saw that already, and we saw it over here. So that makes sense. Um, yeah? Do you have to solve it for every different ionization energy? in the target? Um, yeah, you, you, well, you need to solve for the mean energy of that given target, which has to take into account the distribution of ionization energies. You have to worry about a K-shell electron being knocked out as you do a valence electron. So there's gonna be a mean that you, have to, that you do have to calculate over. Um, so, uh, now, What's the result of all of these uh, of all of these equations? Uh, you basically get it in, in two graphs. The graph on the uh, left is the energy loss in air as a function of uh, part initial particle kinetic energy. The chart on the uh, on the right is uh, the uh, the chart. Uh, let's see, it's a 300 MeV proton in water. It shows the energy loss as a function of distance. Again, left in air, right in water. And uh, what you basically see is as a particle gains energy, the, um, the interaction, uh, the intera sorry, the number, the amount of energy lost uh, per centimeter actually drops. Uh, because electrons are so small, they, they take out less and less energy, the more and more energy the incoming particle has. All right? Uh, and electrons are basically the, uh, the major outlier over here. This is why this, this Basically, this chart is the punchline for why there are two energy regimes. There is a massive, massive gap in behavior between electrons and all the rest of the uh, all the rest of the heavy particles. Now, the results of the chart on the left were calculated with the beta block formula. All right, the density uh, is in units of grams per cubic centimeter. 
So if that's the case, then um, then the energy is in uh, is in units of MeV. The uh, the main feature that, that you ought to be able to see in the right graph, which is again protons in uh, protons going in water. Um, so you basically notice that you have what's known as the Bragg peak, this increase in uh, in energy loss, as because as this goes through more material, it's going to lose more energy. The number of interactions as it loses energy actually increases because now you're 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 in the same in basically the same way that uh, that this chart falls off because remember, in the chart on the right. You're comparing the, the, the line on the chart on the right. I want to make sure I say this right. You're comparing the line or the curve in the chart on the right. The energy is basically moving in the opposite direction. So you are increasing uh, interaction probability as, you, uh, as you're stopping within the material. So as energy loss decreases with increasing energy, it also increases with decreasing energy. And the end result is this Bragg peak where you just as the uh, the particle stops, it gives away the last of its kinetic energy inside uh, inside the material, and it gives away uh, and it yields this classic peak that you can observe in a detector. So that's charged particles inside a uh, sorry, that's charged particles inside uh, inside materials. Uh, another way that charged particles interact with uh, materials is known as Cherenkov radiation. Um, so when a particle moves through a medium faster than uh, the speed of light in that medium, it emits what's known as Cherenkov radiation. Uh, essentially, it's a shock wave. The same way a plane moving through air uh, at, a speed, at the speed faster than the speed of sound in air uh, will create a shock wave, basically a compression of, uh, of sound waves. This is basically, uh, the, this is basically the same idea. Uh, it follows uh, the principle used to explain optical and acoustic phenomena. So when a charged particle travels in a medium, uh, the electric field of a particle essentially polarizes the medium along its path. As the medium becomes unpolarized, it does so at the speed of light within that uh, medium. And so it's that return from polarization that will happen and you get the compression of the electrom uh, you get the compression of the electromagnetic waves as this material, uh, as the particle is, has already passed at a speed through the material faster than the speed of light in that material. The return from polarization is what creates this uh, this shock wave, and the shock wave has a very characteristic uh, blue light. Um, it does have a characteristic blue light uh, because that's where the energy the energy if you look in the visible spectrum of where the energy uh or sorry compare it to the visible spectrum where that energy is peaked uh it ends up uh being blue it is dependent considerably and well, completely upon one the energy of the particle and two the index of refraction of that particle all right and the uh come on and let's see the energy required, uh, the, the wave front that, uh, that's basically, that the, uh, the Cherenkov light is going to propagate at is uh, you can basically calculate simply through trigonometry the same way you would any sort of shock wave uh, from uh, anything breaking the sound barrier. Uh, it's a little easier if we take away this diagram and leave the critical points. The end result is uh, simply the uh, 1 over beta times the ind and the index of refraction. All right. Uh, the minimum energy required to generate Cherenkov light uh, is given by this equation, which again is uh, dependent only upon the, uh, the index of refraction of the material that uh, the electron or any particle is traveling through. I focus on electron because of the energies that we're dealing with uh, in nuclear physics, it's really only the electrons that are moving fast enough to, uh, to create a Cherenkov shower. In astronomy and astrophysics, however, you start to get muons that are moving fast enough that they can actually create a Cherenkov shower. And there's, obs uh, there's observation, there's actually a fair amount of, uh, of observation in astronomy of Cherenkov light from muons interacting with the atmosphere. You deal with Cherenkov radiation in high energy physics to get a very, very good 
um, measurement of the velocity of a particle moving through your detector. So if you've got a detector that is that, that's basically you know, clear enough that uh, you can see the Cherenkov light produced in it and you have a photomultiplier tube attached to it, you can measure the velocity of a particle uh, going through without necessarily detecting it. And the energy loss of a material going through, uh, of a particle going through a material emitting Cherenkov radiation is basically negligible with the energies you're dealing with. So it's a way of measuring a characteristic of an outgoing particle without perturbing it too, too terribly much. Um, if you want to go into uh, Cherenkov radiation and the interaction associated with it, uh, I would actually recommend, um, let's see, there is a second book in uh, my syllabus by uh, an author by the name of Tavernier. Uh, that's a pretty good der uh, derivation and it starts from Maxwell's equation. Uh, if you really want a full on rigorous, um, rigorous derivation, I recommend looking into uh, Jackson's chapter 13. All right. So, now, higher energy, particle moving through a material at higher energy. The, the biggest culprit is, uh, is Bremsstrahlung. Some of you uh, have seen it, some of you haven't. Bremsstrahlung radiation is essentially emitted whenever a charged particle is accelerated. All right? uh, synchrotron radiation is an example of, uh, of Bremsstrahlung, uh, but not the only one. Collisions that happen with, sorry, so interactions and accelerations that happen as, as a result of, of collisions will yield branch problem. Uh, accelerations that result from the interaction with some sort of electric or magnetic field will yield branch problem. All right? In this chart, uh, let's see. In this chart, uh, let's see. Yes, the dashed line in this chart uh, represents the. Um, the amount of energy lost via collision. The, uh, the da dashed line number two is the, uh, the Bremsstrahlung loss, and the, uh, the solid line is the sum of dashed lines one and two. So your collisional losses here, Bremsstrahlung losses are here, and you basically sum these two to get the total. The dotted line, the dotted line is the, uh, the change in energy as a function of x, dE dx, for protons. The larger the mass, the less, uh, the less energy is, uh, is radiated. And so you look at the total radiated power for a given Bremsstrahlung as given by this equation. Uh, for linear acceleration, it uh, goes by gamma to the sixth. For perpendicular acceleration, it goes by gamma to the fourth. All right? Since the energy is simply gamma times mc squared, Linear acceleration goes by, uh, by 1 over mass to the 6th. Um, perpendicular acceleration goes by 1 over mass to the 4th. The larger the mass, the less energy is, uh, is radiated. This is important. Why? It has to do with accelerator construction. <clears throat> why they use accel electrons in linear acceleration? Exactly. It's why the ILC, which is, going to be, which is going to be using electron and positron collisions, has to be linear. So, here's a basic overview of charged particle interactions. Uh, it's a basic summary of what we've gone. It deals with sort of the energy regimes. For alpha particles, you're basically dealing with an energy loss of about 1,000 MeV per, uh, 1 GeV per centimeter. All right? That's going to give you a range of 10 microns. It's why alphas aren't particularly dangerous. Uh, and, you know, if you're in an environment that's sort of heavy in alphas, as long as you take a shower after you're done, the alphas aren't going to penetrate your skin. They're not going to make it through and, and, and cause any real damage. Betas lose less energy per centimeter. They have a longer range, all right? Uh, they deal with branch strong a lot earlier simply because of their, uh, their lower mass. They're going to scatter multiple times as they slow down, and that's going to be very important in the next lecture as we deal with gaseous detectors, all right? The, um, the particularly nice thing, well, not nice, but a, uh, an important caveat is uh, when a beta plus stops, so when a positron stops, it doesn't just get absorbed in the environment as a positron, it annihilates with the, uh, the next electron that it touches. Uh, and when that annihilation happens, it also uh, emits two 511 keV gamma rays, all right? Protons 
similar to Alphas, uh, since they are uh, a bit lighter, you've got slightly longer um, stopping distance, about a millimeter in a solid and one meter in the gas. It's going to basically follow a straight tra uh, trajectory. All right, nuclear fragments are even more similar to Alphas. Uh, they're going to stop e even less di distance than an Alpha. Um, so uh, it's also going to follow a straight line trajectory. So that's charged particles. Now we've got photons, and uh, we should have enough time to get to the end. Excellent. Um, so photons, when they interact with matter, uh, they're primarily going to interact in, uh, in three ways. One is the photoelectric effect. Two, Compton scattering. Three is pair production. After that, there are some others. Uh, photo disintegration is one that comes to mind immediately, but it, we're not really going to talk about it in the context of, uh, of this class. It makes a considerable amount of difference in, uh, in uh, nuclear astrophysics, but for regular everyday detector physics, it's not something that, uh, that we deal with so much. Um, photoelectric effect and Compton scattering are really the, uh, the biggest ones that we're going to deal with for photon detectors. And of those, photoelectric effect is by far the largest one that we deal with. All right? Photons in general have a longer range in matter. There's, uh, there's less interactions uh, per unit length. And when photons interact, they experience no energy loss. They're either absorbed or they're not. This isn't about a particle that bounces back and forth. There's either a photon absorption or there's not. What you do have is that you have a beam of photons. So it's not one photon, it's a beam of many photons. And they, that beam gets attenuated over some unit distance. So as you go farther, you have fewer and fewer photons remaining because more and more photons interact. All right. In this equation, uh, mu is what's known as the absorption coefficient, and x is simply the material thickness at that point. Um, for the photoelectric effect, uh, let's see. You're, you're basically dealing with simply a difference uh, in energy. H bar omega is uh, the energy of your photon. Omega is the angular frequency of, uh, of the photon. And so the photon is absorbed by some electron. That electron has a binding energy. If the energy is greater than the binding energy, you get a free electron. If not, you get an excited electron that's still bound. If it's a free electron, whatever is left over from the initial energy of the photon minus the binding energy, that's the kinetic energy of the electron that you've kicked out. Uh, in for, uh, let's see, for photons less than about 1,000 keV, sorry, 100 keV, the photoelectric effect is going to dominate. It's what we deal with uh, with visible light or sort of any sort of scintillation detector. Uh, higher energy is going to behave differently, and we will discuss that. Um, the cross-section that you're dealing with is, uh, is given by, uh, by this equation over here, which is a function of the, uh, the charge of the, uh, the target material and the energy of the incoming, um, excuse me, the energy of the incoming particle. Uh, oh, sorry, the incoming uh, photon. N is uh, material dependent and uh, is normally between uh, 3 and 4 in this case. All right, and what you get are uh, characteristic uh, photoelectron peaks. If you plot uh, the, the cross section as a function of energy, uh, you basically get uh, what are known as you know these edges and these peaks that are uh, that correspond to the uh, what's what am I looking for? The uh, it's not band gaps. The uh, the excitation energies of the uh, the closed shells of the bound electrons. So you've got your, your K shell, which is the, the, the most bound shell, your, uh, your L shell, which is the next most bound shell, and then you've got other smaller energies uh, as you get towards the valence electrons. Compton scattering, basically an elastic collision between a uh, photon and an electron. Even though it's technically a collision, it's not really. The energy is completely absorbed, and then re-emitted as a photon with a different energy. The energy then also goes to uh, the recoil electron, and uh, the difference between the emitted photon's frequency and the initial photon's frequency or energy, um, they're one and the same, uh, is given by this formula up here. And uh, for homework, uh, your job is to derive this equation. Um, 
I'll uh, I'll post the uh, the results uh, or sorry the uh, the solution on uh, on Wednesday night, and uh, it shouldn't be too too hard. It's, we're talking basically a page of uh, of derivation, maybe a page and a half depending on how large you write. Um, the uh, the cross section uh, is essentially given by this. You won't actually need this to solve the uh, the equation here. The uh, the Nishina uh, the Klein Nishina formula is essentially given. Uh, Uh, the last bit of uh, photon interaction with matter uh, is pair production, and that's basically when the photon is, uh, is equal to um, the mass of a particle and its own antiparticle. We're dealing mostly with, um, with electrons and positrons because that's the lowest energy that, uh, that will produce a, uh, a pair. All right. The muon is basically going to take about uh, 200, yeah, 211 MeV. Uh, photons in order to start producing a pair, and uh, to pr uh, to create a proton and uh, antiproton pair, you need uh, photons in the region of about two GeV. Um, for for the production to last, it has to occur near the nucleus. Otherwise, the momentum isn't conserved. Uh, Whatever pair is produced in vacuum basically reannihilate just as soon as they are uh, uh, as they are created. All right. For the uh, for the pairs to survive, you have to be near some amount of material, uh, because if there was no material near the photon, you basically have you you could basically create a reference frame. Or, yeah, reference frame where the electron and the positron have zero momentum. If that's the case, then the photon that, uh, that comes in would also have zero momentum, and that's impossible. All right? Near the nucleus, the Coulomb field allows the, uh, the nucleus to absorb some of the momentum, and that allows the electrons and the posit uh, positrons to survive. Here, though, is the, uh, the complete photon interaction range. It's basically a sum of everything that uh, you could possibly be uh, interacting with uh, as a function of energy. On the left is uh, photon interaction with a carbon target, on the right with a, uh, a lead target, and so you see immediately some interesting features. The K-shell for the lead is obviously different in energy than it is for, uh, for the carbon. You've got many, many more electrons in a much, much more tightly bound shell. Uh, K shell in uh, in your lead, the uh, and this is basically a sum. The the the, the points are summed uh, from the contributions of all the other lines. So whether it's Compton or Rayleigh scattering, uh, whatever nuclear interactions that you deal that you deal with, you start out being very photo uh, uh, what's it photoelectric effect dominated, and then uh, it becomes more scattering, and then finally, as energy gets large enough that you can start interacting with the nucleus, the nuclear component begins to dominate. Uh, neutrons basically operate uh, within the, uh, only with the, uh, the strong interaction, right? They're not charged, there's no Coulomb interaction, and so because you're only dealing with the strong interaction, you need to be very, very close to the nucleus of whatever it is you're interacting with, all right? You're talking by very, very close, I mean 10 to the minus 13 centimeters or less. All right? There are three basic uh, energy regimes that you're dealing with when you're talking about neutron interaction. One is slow neutrons, less than half an e, then that's less than half an EV. You're only going to be dealing with uh, elastic scattering. And so in that, you're talking about captures of neutrons inside of, uh, of a uh, nucleus, and then the neutron-induced emission of any number of different particles. All right. That last one, by the way, the F stands for fission. Now, fast neutrons, energy range of uh, 0.1 to about 10 MeV. Uh, that's basically elastic scattering, and you get neutron capture followed by the radiative emission of, uh, of a photon. So now you're not destabilizing a nucleus, you're, you're, you're staying in and uh, you are emitting a photon as the excited neutron uh, is bound and, is, uh, and, and relaxes inside the, uh, the nucleus. You can get inelastic scattering where uh, the nucleus is sort of left in an excited state, which can then emit its own photon or emit some other charged particle. And then, finally, what? 
you get into the high energy regime. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about that because it's not something that we deal with here uh, at Triumph unless you're an Atlas person, but for that, you're going to want to deal with uh, reactions that are, uh, that are done in the, uh, in the LHC. So that's where we are by the end of today. Uh, next week, we're going to uh, deal with uh, gaseous detectors. Hope you all enjoyed. If you have any questions, please feel free.